Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma and in this video we're going to be continuing my How to Start Collecting series and in this particular video we are going to be talking about how to start collecting Sylvaneth. So something I just want to say at the start of this video is I have actually got a bit of a sore throat at the moment so apologies if that does come through in the recording but I just wanted to get this video out to you guys as I know you've been waiting a while for it. So the other thing I do want to address in this video is Sylvaneth is not the most competitive army at the moment so if you want to put that in the comments you can already but I'm just getting it out of the way now. If you want to play an army that is more competitive play another one. Sylvaneth is one of the bottom competitive armies at the moment and what I will say is if you do really want to play Sylvaneth but obviously you want to wait for them to be a bit more competitive wait until they get a new Bastion. So I just wanted to get that out of the way now because something I am going to be bringing up in this video is when a lot of people talk about Sylvaneth the thing is they don't even talk about them they just push them to the side saying like they're no good no point mentioning them. Well if there's no point mentioning them the people who are trying to get into this hobby don't understand why they're not very good or anything like that and as part of that we'll be reviewing this army as a whole and not as in a much detail as I do for things like my Osrich Bone Reaper series in the moment or Slave's Darkness one, Beast of Chaos one, Nighthorn, all the other ones I've done just sort of an overall feel because the point of this video is to try and help you guys know how to start this army but also just to bring some light and showing you that it's not you know unplayable or anything like that if anything I think that the armies that people tend to focus on which are the top shall we say five armies I think there's more of a problem with them being too good than a problem with armies like this being too bad. I do think armies like this can be made better and like I say wait until they get a new battle tome if you really want to play them as like competitive as they can be because hopefully in a new battle tome there will be but the point like I say it will be me showing you that these armies have still got some play they're just going to be a bit harder you may lose like your first quite a few games or anything like that but in my opinion that's fine because you learn through your mistakes and playing the game anyway it's going to make you a better player in the game rather than just being reliant on your army but with that it is going to be a challenge so it's going to be a lot harder for you to win your games with depending on who you're going against the matchups anything like that but not gonna lie there's a lot of armies out there where you can give them a fair game with this army as well so I think it's important for us to detach ourselves away from like I say like the top five armies whatever they are and really focus on the fact that not every single game you're playing is going to be at a tournament. So to summarise the Sylvaneth are uh, one of the least strongest army in the game. Games Workshop should make them better and Games Workshop should make a less divide between the strongest armies in the game and the weakest armies in the game. So with all that aside that I felt like I had to say before going into this video for Sylvaneth as I don't want to mislead people here I am completely honest if you want to play an army that's not going to be so hard to win your games with play another army simple as I don't know why I play Sylvaneth and stuff as well so you go check that out if you would like to and I've also done a why play Winterleaf one at this moment of recording and I plan to do more why plays on their sub at some point in the future when you guys vote for them to get it so something else I do want to say before we get into the main or how to start collecting this video is the laws just in case you're not really too sure who they are I have done more law on why play Sylvaneth as a whole so go check up that video if you'd like to but essentially Sylvaneth I'm just going to say it as this they are magical trees and spirits that possess the trees and everything else but they're not your happy Disney trees and anyone stumbles into their forest they will happily give them the worst death imaginable and make it so that they can probably still be sentient all the way through it so they know just how much of a pain it was for them to step on that grass upon the glade of the Sylvaneth and they will forever regret it. When you see things like skulls and stuff and dryads and other members of the Sylvaneth, yeah, they used to belong to people who were maybe, in mine and your eyes, innocent. So they're not the nicest, but they're in team order. So hey, those are, I suppose, the good guys. But anyway, with that aside, the last thing I just want to say before we get into the video is to say a massive shout out to my patrons and my YouTube members who, because of them, I am able to do this YouTube channel and continue to make these videos to help people get into Age of Sigma and to continue the Age of Sigma journey. So... It's going to be my Morgas, who are my top supporters. So this is going to be Jonathan H, Philco, Bleed Red, and Christopher G. Thank you so much, guys, for that tier. You're giving so much support to the channel that it's really making a huge difference. And I honestly don't want to say, but often thank you massively. And then we've got my Vampires, which are Mir, Martin S, Rouse321, David A, Ronnie H, Doug P, and Spare Bear. Guys, as well, that tier, you're giving so much support. Huge thank you to you guys, and please keep up the work. And then, of course, my Necromancers, which is Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolfnick, Michael W, Quad, Cranky Wombat, Christopher F, 
Christopher C, James S and Steve T. All you guys down there as well are massively helping support the channel. So to so everyone on my Patreon YouTube members, thank you so much for your support. I wouldn't be able to keep making these videos without you, like I said, and please keep up the great work. If any of you would like to become a Patreon or a YouTube member you'll see a join button or there's a link to my page on the description but we'll get to that later so now going into the actual video talking about the sylvaneth now the first thing you'll want to do is going to be the first buys and this is something that i've came up with my format now and i talk about this stuff in videos and this is the things that you want to buy first off when you get the army because we can get carried away with buying models and everything like that but the real things you want to get with this army is going to be the battle tome and of course the scenery piece, which is the Sylvaneth Awakened Wildwood, which essentially just looks like the three trees in a ring with each other. They are like a newer model, they used to be an old model as well. So why do you want to have these two things for your first buys? Firstly, it's because the Battle Tome, for me, and I know a lot of you people out there as well, gives you so much inspiration on how to just build your army, even coming from just like a lore perspective or maybe like a painting perspective as well. And then of course in terms of rules and units and things that you can really aim towards building a whole collection around, or maybe just an army list, which could be things like battalions, could be things like the sub allegiances, which we'll have like a brief talk about later. And then it will also have things in it like good unit combinations and synergies with things like artifacts, command traits, spell laws, everything like that. So the other nice thing about the Battle Tome as well is of course what I'll just quickly say as well, if you can see the one on your screen and you go, I don't recognize that as the new Battle Tome, and that you're watching this in a year or two from now, bear in mind the timestamp on this is actually going to be the 6th of the 3rd, 2021. If there's a new Battle Tome out, sure, get that. And then probably what I just said at the start of this video about this army not being very good may no longer be relevant. So if that is the case, fantastic. But yes, yeah, so the Battle Tome gives you everything you need to know how to actually start collecting your army and build your army. So I definitely recommend getting you that. Essentially, it's got all your rules in it, right? And then why get the Sylvaneth Awakened Wildwood? Now that's because no matter how you want to build your Sylvaneth army, you are going to want to have trees in your army. Because this is absolutely free for a Sylvaneth army to bring a Sylvaneth Wildwood. And a Sylvaneth Wildwood would actually consist of either three trees or six trees. So what does that mean? Basically, you just make a circle with the trees. You need at least three of them to make a circle. But you can take... A Sylvaneth Wildwood can be up to six trees. So basically you buy the scenery pack twice. And I know that sounds a bit like a way for Games Workshop to try and get more money out of you, which probably is, you know, they're a very greedy company, but it also means it's good for you in the game as well. So you might as well do it if you can, but if you can't, just get one pack for now and it'll be fine. You can also summon them in later in the game and stuff. I think it's a tree of ancient that can do that as well. So there's reasons to buy lots and lots of trees. And they're not like the hardest models to paint and they're quite nice and it really does theme with the army obviously because you are literally an army of walking trees. But what are the Sylvaneth Awakened Wildwoods actually going to help you out in terms of like rules in the game? Essentially you can use them to deep strike. Now what does deep strike mean? That means instead of setting up units normally in deployment you can actually put them to the side and set them up in the Wildwood. I believe it is for however many units you have on the table you can set up up one in the wildwood so if you've got one unit already deployed in the table that means the second unit you can set up in the wildwood etc etc you can also use them for teleportation during the game they also align a sight blocking presuming that either you or the thing you're trying to target cannot fly so if you have a lariel behind this you can see straight through it or if you had a tree lord ancient trying to shoot i don't know an archaeon going through the wildwood he can see archaeon as he can fly as an example there you can also use it as a way to teleport around the board, which is very useful. And then you've got a way to make it try and do damage to your enemy, which is basically if you cast a spell next to this thing, it essentially annoys it a lot. And what that means is enemy units that are within one inch of the Sylvaneth Wild. But bear in mind, you can make it quite big, can't you? Because like we said, you can um, have six trees in a circle. Those units will suffer D three mortal wounds on a five up which i know is like not the most reliable and like it could be made better but it's still something and it's still definitely worth remembering also when enemy units finish a charge when they're within one inch of the sylvan of wildwood on a six they suffer d3 mortal wounds so again those sort of rolls that you need like fives and sixes aren't the most reliable but definitely worth remembering as when i played against sylvan F, i have happened to have uh, rolled those dice and I have taken quite a bit of mortal wounds that if I realised I was going to take that one and make the charge, maybe I wouldn't have made the charge. So it definitely is useful and it's not as bad as people always make out. 
So those are the two first buys I would say to get. Now what I will also say with that is I know it doesn't sound the most exciting thing, you know, buy a book in a bunch of trees, but your whole army is trees. So if you love that theme, you're probably already on board at this point. But um, essentially, you know, buying a book in a scenery piece is the most exciting thing. It's what you're going to use in all your armies, like I say, because you get them for free. Obviously, not in terms of money, but I mean, the points for the Sylvaneth Wildwoods are free in your Sylvaneth army, so you're going to be using them. And then the book you need for all your rules. Games Workshop officially states you don't need a battle time to play an army, which is technically true, but it's not a nice technically, and you do need a battle time, particularly if you're playing an army like Sylvaneth, which needs all the help it can get, as we've already mentioned. So, but they give you all the like, like I said, law and rules and everything. So you've got all that sorted and then the wild wood you're going to be bringing anyway, right? So those are the reasons why I say to get those before you even look at anything else. And also, if this is not your first army and I don't know, you play some games at homes with your buddies and all that sort of thing. Then you can use the Awakened Sylvaneth Wildwood as just normal trees on a battlefield for terrain purposes. As just like something to bring your games a bit more alive with nice looking terrain. So you can get more use out of it. But anyway, so with the first buys out of the way, the next thing I want to look at is going to be something that I often look at when I do these start collecting videos. As long as they have a start collecting box, I will review it, and of course the Silver Nerf do have one, and we'll get into that now. So the start collecting box will cost you £55. If you were to buy it separately, it would cost you £82.50. Again, I haven't done all the currencies for around the world because that'll take forever and I haven't got enough room on this page to do it. So what do you get in this box then? So you are going to get one or two leaders. Now this is going to be one branch witch and potentially one spirit of Durfu slash Sylvaneth Tree Lord Ancients. What do I mean by, you know, potentially? Essentially, the big tree lord you can see in the background of Renu Sylvaneth, the big monster looking tree. You can basically make that a leader if you would like to, instead of the normal tree lord as you can see in the picture. So what I would also say is if you're coming from, let's say, 40k, a leader is essentially like a HQ. I would say they are basically a hero, but they're not always, so they always have the hero keyword, which can play a part later, but that's more information than you need right now. So then for one battle line unit we get in this box is 16 dryads. Now that's an odd number of dryads because they come in units of 10. It's just how Games Workshop packages them from how they were in Warhammer Fantasy. So just bear that in mind. Look at this and you just get six extra dryads rather than a four too short for a, for a unit of 20, which would be uh, which would be nice, but obviously Games Workshop aren't gonna do that. So then for our one behemoth, we have one spirit of death, we slash Sylvan of Tree Lord, Ancient slash Sylvan of Tree Lord, because no matter which way you want to build that, essentially Tree Lord, it's going to be a behemoth, which is understandable as a massive fucking tree. So what do we think of this box when we look at it as a whole? So the Branch Witch, which I'll, I'll get into a bit later, I don't really think is the best hero in this army. It doesn't really add a lot to the army from what I can see. There is a better variant of it called the Branch Waif. And when I mean a better variant, it's not the same model, but it's like, you know, the same little branch wizard hero, if you like. And um, I do think it's a nice model, but I really feel like it looks like it fits really well in this box, like thematically and stuff, but it doesn't really have so much a place. And then we have the Spirit of Derfu or the Sylvaneth Tree Lord Ancient, and then the Tree Lord we could make. So the Sylvaneth Tree Lord always just feels like it doesn't, really excel at much it's a monster that's not really strong it's quite cheap but it's not really strong and that, that's really all it does i will say though i have gone against one of those things and i charged it with a full health block of three models of varangard so you know three charged and full health into a tree lord ancient i left that combat because i was like i heard tree lord ancients are basically quite crap i don't need to worry about that and then the Tree Lord Ancient turned around and did about 20 something damage to my unit of three Varangard who have a free up save and wipes them out. And I was like, oh, so it can be really good if my opponent's lucky at rolling. So they're not all useless and they are cheaper than if you want to go to the Spirit of Durfu and the Sylvan of Tree Lord Ancient. So why do you want to go to the Sylvan of Tree Lord Ancient? Essentially, it's going to be your magic Tree Lord. So again, it's only a one cast wizard. It really feels like it should be a two cast wizard. What do I mean by one cast and two cast? Because you're new. Basically, you can only cast one spell in your turn. And with the size of it, and bear in mind, it's, it's an ancient and everything. You think it should be two, but it's only one. Um, it has got a shooting attack, which is nice. And it can set up that Sylvan F. Wildwood, like I've mentioned. So it has got some utility there. And then when we go on to the Spirit of Durfu, why is he used? Why do you have a Spirit of Durfu in your list? Now, that is because 
it is pretty damn good in combat, especially next to a Sylvanath Wildwood. This is your heavy hitter of a hero in your army. Yes, you have Alara, which we'll get to in a moment, but for point's sake and everything, the Spirit of Durfu is going to be your best one. That sword can be really, really good if you get to swing first. So you have flexibility in which ones you want to build. And then just quickly mention about the Dryads as well. They can be quite survivable. When you first look at them, they've got a five up save, but if they're next to a Sylvanath Wildwood, they're getting plus one to their saves, so that's a four up. And then they can make a enemy unit minus one to hit them, and then they can make themselves plus one to hit an enemy unit by like entangling them and stuff. So they can be better than when you just first look at their stat line as well, is what I would say there. So it's not a bad box. You're gonna wanna get yourself the, basically the Tree Lord kit, as I call it that. And you're gonna wanna get yourself Dryads, I would say, generally in this army because they are your best, like, survivable infantry, if you like. We'll go into the different variations of battle lines you can get in a moment, but just as a summary of this box. So what do I think of this box to get? Is it actually going to be a good start collecting box? Because Games Workshop, when they do these start collecting box, they say this is the best way to do this army, no matter what. I mentioned when I talked about the Gloomsway Gits as an example that unless you want to go all fun with Trogoffs and uh, Squigs and stuff, I, what I would like to do, but if you want to take it more competitively, it's not the best way to start that army at all. Avoid that start collecting box. And the same with the uh, Seeds of Sigma. Avoid those two start collecting boxes there because they're not very useful as well if you want to go on that competitive route. So just a couple of examples there why it's important to talk about this rather than just going Games Workshop saying us it's the best thing to do. It is. It's not. But talking about the start collecting one for the Silver Note, bringing it back to this video, is I would say it's a good way to do this army. Now you're going to want to get yourself some Kern of Hunters and it's a real shame you don't get Kern of Hunters in this box because they are probably your best overall unit in this whole army and you don't get them in this box which is annoying but you're also going to get some useful things in this box and you're going to get some nice models as well. So I would say this is a start collecting box to get. Again, like I've already mentioned, I don't actually play this army so if you're an experienced player of this army and maybe you've been playing it for a long time and you think differently to me with anything I say throughout this video let me know that down below because you're not just letting me know you're letting everyone else who's watching this video and trying to learn how to start collecting this army know from your own experience and your advice so please do that as well if you feel like you want to and that is the start collecting box done for the silver nef more I'll just quickly say is that so the saving you're going to be getting here Bear in mind, go with a third party, so just one of the other online retailers, not sponsored by any, so I won't mention any names and stuff. But if you go with those third party retailers, you can find some of them are like a third percent off, so it'll be a third percent off the price of this box, whatever it is in your currency, which will really help you when you want to start collecting that army. And not just obviously with this box, with any of the boxes and kits. Definitely go third party retailers, save yourself some money. Now, usually at this point in the video, I'll do what I believe are the auto includes and the almost auto includes in an army. So you know what you wanna buy sort of straight off the bat after you've got the battle tome and you've got the scenery piece. However, with Sylvaneth, as it happens to be in that place, like I said, it's not very strong. There's not really like, this is the one build to go five and oh or anything like that. So I haven't got auto includes and almost auto includes. What I've decided to do is go over the main units you've got in this army and sort of just give you my thoughts on them. So the first one we're going to look at is probably the most um, controversial as well. It's going to be Alayle the Ever Queen, And why I say that is because there's a sort of a, uh, a joke that we say going around in the hobby saying that, you know, she might as well be free. Now, that's just like a common thing what people will say because they'll basically just joke about how bad she is in the game. So the idea of this is actually we're going to be going like quickly through the war scroll. You'll just see a picture of her on the screen, but I'll quickly go through basically the war scroll and tell you my thoughts on her and really say if I think she should be free. Now, she is 600 points, and just off the bat, do I think she should be 600 points? No. But should she be free? Honestly, she's not that goddamn bad, all right? So let's have a look to see, rather than everyone just bashing her off and not even talking about her. So, her will stat has got a movement of 16, which will degrade over time. She's got a free up save. She's got bravery 10 and 16 wounds. So, so far, what is not to like about that? I don't really understand. We then have, for her weapons... The Spear of Kurnoff. So this has a range that starts at 30 inches. So a huge threat range there, especially with her 16 inch movement. She has one attack, freeze the hit, twos the wound, minus two rend, d6 damage. So what I would say there is, bear in mind she is 600 points, that it's only one attack. So you're bound to roll like a, either a two or one to hit with it, or you're bound to roll a one to wound because all these one attacks like one d6 damage attack sort of things, you will always fail for some god knows reason. But 
With a minus two Rennie, when you do get a through, it's only D6 damage. I think if that was just a flat, I don't know, five damage or something, and then it's just a way to just snipe out those support characters your enemy has, I think that would see so much more play, and I think it would be so much more useful. So it would be nice even if it was just, instead of D6, obviously five damage is better, but fuck it, make it five damage. It would just make it so much uh, more reliable, and then it will make her have more play in the game. And then going on to her melee weapons, we have the Talon of uh, Dwindling. So this is a 1-inch range weapon, 4 attacks, 3s and 4s, no rend, and 1 damage. So the problem I have with this is essentially, it doesn't look great off the bat obviously, but what you've got to bear in mind is in the abilities, if she gets a 6 to hit with this weapon, the uh, talent, it's going to do D3 mortal wounds onto the target as well as normal damage. Which is good, but honestly I think this thing should be um, freeze and freeze, minus one rend, one damage as well. Could just be one damage, but with the mortals on the sixes to hit, um, j just make it better. Bear in mind she is a god, right? She's not, <laughs> she's not like a, um, a, just a normal character. She is a god, so yeah, make it not wound on fours. I, I personally think that would be more godlike, right? So you've got that. And then you've got the Great Antlers. So this is obviously from her big beetle. So this is 2 inch range, 5 attacks, 4s and 3s, minus 2 rend, and 5 damage. But the 5 damage will degrade over time as the beetle will get obviously beaten up and stuff and its horns become less sharp or big to uh, hurt the enemy. So the problem I've got here is, is a 4 to hit. Honestly, 4 to hit. They sound alright because like, it's 50 spent chance you'll get it. <laughs> it won't. Honestly, it won't happen all the time. Like... I was watching a, a buddy of mine uh, play with a Stonehorn yesterday on TTS, and I know that's a Stonehorn different army, but anyway, it was hitting on fours, right? And he just rolled like his five attacks, however many attacks it had, and he just didn't get any fours. And it just shows that it's, you know, you can't rely on the odds there. So it would be nice if it was freeze. There is a way to make it freeze, and that is essentially if you're attacking a unit that contains five or more enemy models. So, like, against hordes, or not even really against hordes, even just units of fives and stuff you are hitting on threes but it'd be nice if it was already threes and then you got plus one to it so it's hitting on twos yeah that would be very strong but like i said she's a god she's 600 points it would be good um but it's not a bad weapon because you've got you know like i said freeze the wind minus two rend and then five damage which is nice there's a nice amount of rend on this so then we're going to go on to the ability so of course you can fly on that beetle we've already talked about the talon and then she's got a life bloom, which is her next one. So in your hero phase, you can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to each friendly Sylvaneth unit wholly within 30 inches of this model. Roll separately for each unit. So that's good because you have a lot of multi-wound uh, models in this army. Obviously your infantry is not multi-wound. And I think what would be really nice here is if it could return a D3 wounds worth of models to those units. Instead, like we see a lot with Nighthorn as an example, or Legions of the Gash as an example, with Gravesides and uh, Invocation of Death. It'd be nice to see something similar like that for life here as well. Um, but yeah, not bad. And then we've got Sweeping Blows. So that's the one that I mentioned where it was add one to the hit rolls for attacks made. With the Great Antlers if the target contains five or more models. So like I said, it is useful. And then you've got a Living Battering Ram. So roll a dice for each enemy unit that is within one inch of this model after this model makes a charge move. On a 4+, plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So she is on a big base, which is good. The problem is, it's on a 4+, plus. a lot of things these days are on 2+. Pluses. And when I mean a lot of things, I mean we're even just talking about a chariot. When that makes a charge in, um, I don't know, like a, a Gorby's chariot as an example. Or a Chaos Lord on Karkadrak in Slates of Darkness. Um, on a 2+, plus, the D3 mortal wounds. She's a god on a massive fucking beetle. And it only goes on a 4+. Plus. Like... Just things like that seem silly. I think even my like corn dragon I have maybe a four plus or a three plus, which is stupid. <laughs> we have like a chariot or some guy on a little, uh, I don't know, reptilian rhino <laughs> on a like two plus, right? Um, but then she has her next ability, which is all about summoning. And essentially, what this means is once per game, at the end of your movement phase, you can either summon twenty dryads, ten tree remnants, ten spike remnants, three kernel hunters, one branch witch. Or one tree lord. So you can summon one of those things you can summon. So when you summon it, the summon unit is added to your army and must be still wholly within nine inches of Alarial. 
and more than nine inches from any enemy unit. So the problem with that is if Valeria was stuck in the fighting, you may find it hard to summon uh, when she's already in combat, so maybe something you do early on. And I'll be honest, free Cone of Hunters is cool. You can choose obviously what variation or weapon you want to give it. The Tree Lord, what a lot of people joke about. Remember I said I wiped out free Varengard. God knows how it did it, but like it was lucky enough to do it. Um, and then you've got things like the 20 Dryads, which is a nice block there. 10 Tree Reverence, the teleport around the board isn't bad. Um, 10 Spike Reverence, I probably wouldn't do the branch, uh, which I probably wouldn't do either. Um, but I'd say probably the Kern of Hunters, the Tree Reverence and the Dryads are a good thing to summon. Because obviously it, you're summoning it for free at the end of the day. Um, and then going on to the Command Beard, you've got Gaian's Wrath. So you can use this Command Beard at the start of the combat phase. If you do so, in that phase... You can re-roll Wound Draws or Wands for attacks made by friendly Sylvaneth units while they are wholly within 18 inches of a friendly model with this command ability. So, not the best command ability out there, but not bad. And it may say like wholly within 14. Your Kern of Hunters can basically be little pocket bubbles of extending that ability. So units will be affected by this command ability if they're wholly within 12 inches of units of Kern of Hunters. So, it sounds like a really short range, bear in mind it's on a big base. So, it's a little bit bigger than you think but then your Kern of Hunters can like extend it if you like. So yeah, it's not too bad as you first read it. And then she has for her magic, so she can cast free spells and unbind free spells. Very useful in today's world where there's a very big shooting and uh, magic meta out there, particularly on the magic. The only problem is that she's not really getting any inherent like pluses to cast or unbind, which is her downfall and she really needs that. Like I said, she's a god at the end of the day. She should have that. If a dead frog can get <laughs> stupid amounts of pluses to cast an unbind, why can't the god of life? But her spell is a Metamorpheus, which I believe is pronounced. As cast of 7, if successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within 6 inches of the caster that is visible to them and roll a number of dice equal to the casting roll. For each 4 plus, that unit suffers one mortal wound. In addition, if that unit is destroyed by the mortal wounds inflicted by the spell, you can set up... One awakened wildwood terrain feature, wholly within 12 inches of the last model from that unit to be slain, and more than one inch from any other model, terrain feature, or objective, add it to your army. So it's not a four plus, right? To be able to do the mortal wound in the first place, you need to cast it on a seven. As far as I'm aware, unless I'm missing something, guys, she's not getting any pluses to cast, so it's not even guaranteed for this to go off. Yes, on the average, she will, but enemy on binding is really strong at the moment like we just mentioned and also if you manage to wipe out that enemy unit because at some point in the game there will be like straggling enemy units with like two wounds left in it so you can do it but it's probably going to be quite hard to bring on that wildwood because it has to be away from all these other things and the wildwoods are big in size like we've already mentioned so and it has to be close to where that enemy unit was killed yeah i just it's not a good spell right Almost reminds me a little bit like Archeon, you know, the Lord of the End Times and everything like that, the Grand Marshal of the Apocalypse, the Ever Chosen, and he doesn't have a, actually a unique spell on his War Scroll. She does, but it's not particularly useful. Obviously, both of those models can pick from their own respective laws. So you have got that as well. Um, and then when we go on to the keywords for her, she's Order, Sylvaneth, Monster, Hero, Wizard, Alara, or the Ever Queen. So what are my overall thoughts on her? Is she too expensive for her points? You know, does she make up value in her points you were spending her, or is it a waste? She doesn't make value in her points because the best thing she is at is combat. And she's not even fantastic at it. And this is in my honest opinion. Like, she's good for summoning. You've got that. But then again, you're spending 600 points on her where you could get a lot more of the stuff that she could summon instead of spending the points on her. She's a free cast wizard, but like we said, no pluses to cast, plus one bind. So it's not great depending on who you're fighting. Um, she hasn't got a good spell. Yeah, just, just feels really mediocre. But I'm not going to go as far to the point where I'd say she is useless to the point where zero points for her and she's still not worth it. I honestly think she's not that bad, right? Like, as we've gone through, she's not that bad. She has got some use. I'm just comparing her to other things of, like, godlike level. But if you were to make her, let's say, 400 points, that's half the points of our Kaon, as an example. And some people may still say that's too many points. But I think if Games Workshop... Wanted to actually try and help her out. Make her 400 points. See how she does. She might be too good for that point. She may be not good enough. But just cut a third of her points. 
and see how that looks. Because she's still got some play. She's helping out your army in combat. She's summoning. She's not bad in combat. She's not the biggest beat stick, like I mentioned, but she's not bad. She's got some shooting if you're lucky with the missile weapon. Um, and then if there were ways to give her plus to the cast, I really think she could be good. If there was a way to give her plus two or plus three to cast or something like that, you could build into it. Then she's a free cast wizard with like plus three to cast would be pretty damn tasty. So she's not god awful, but she's got a while to go for her to be worth a point is what I would say. If I was playing Sylvaneth, I would be interested in testing her out. Maybe that's something I would do on TTS just to see actually what she is like on the table now that we've gone through the theory. But like we said, this is not a huge in-depth video of going through every single unit in this book, discussing it in great depth like I do in my Long Army series, but I do feel like it was necessary to talk about Alarial in a bit of depth so we knew what we're talking about when people say like, oh, don't even mention her. You know, if you mention her, like people like get disgusted. She's not that bad, okay? I'm just saying that. So moving on to the next thing. And then moving on to the second name character you have within the Sylvaneth is going to be Dreitcher. So again, like I don't think I mentioned this with but again with Alario, I do really like Dreitcher's model and also Alario's model. You know, the beat was fantastic, everything else. And then Dreitcher's model really does uh, stand out to me as sort of like someone in Hamilton, like a battle suit or something, a little bit like a Dreadnought, but I do like it and I think it's cool. And it's a really interesting take on bringing that character into the realms of Age of Sigma. So what do I think about her in terms of rules? Unfortunately, as some other stuff in the Sylvan F battle tome, she does suffer from being too expensive in points in my honest opinion. So she's 300 points. She's a one cast wizard. If she was a two cast wizard, and I really feel like she should be being a name character or anything else, I could see more versatility in her. But essentially what she's going to do is she's going to chuck bucket loads of attacks at the enemy. But she is the same points cost as a Spirit of Durfu. And I know there may be more utility in Dreitcher than Durfu. I would rather prefer a Spirit of Durfu. She is good for Spike Revenant. She can make them reroll like Wound Rolls of 1 if they're in range of her. So it could be useful if you want to go for like a build in that sort of category, to be fair. Um, but I've seen more use out of her in things like Living City, where she can come on a board edge, she can shoot the enemy, then she can move towards the enemy, charge the enemy, and then finish them off in combat, which has been used against me, and it's been used very effectively, as I sort of underestimated her. So, although I don't think she's particularly fantastic in the Sylvan Fast Tome, she is particularly useful in Living Cities, if that's something you can play towards as well. But I don't think she's god awful. Like that's another thing. I know I use that to explain Alara the Ever Queen, but I also think it's the same for Dreitra as well. Like she has potentially got some play. And what I'd be interested again, like I mentioned earlier is your guys' experience. So if you're watching this and you're still a player and you've actually used her, what are your thoughts about her? Um, how can you make the most out of her as well? If you can let me know that in the comments as well, that would be fantastic. So then the next one we're going to go on to is going to be like the Tree Lord kit, as I've called it, because basically you can make three different types of Tree Lords. So I'll just call it that. And I know we've quickly mentioned these already, but I just want to go into a bit more detail. So we've got the Spirit of Durfee, who, like I said, is the combat-focused one. And also, if you're quite new, you may be going Spirit of Durfu. Is that like Durfu from Warhammer Fantasy? It's a spirit of him, but he's not a named character. So he can be given a command trait, an artifact, and anything else. But the nice thing about him is that he is making six attacks with a shooting attack, 15 inch range, all doing D3 damage. Now, the number of attacks he makes with that does come down. But for something that you, know, you may not think is particularly a shooting unit, he can do some damage at range. Then going into combat. This is where, like I said, he is the combat monster for the army. And that's because he's got this thing called the Guardian Sword, which is three attacks, freeze and freeze, minus two rend, and six damage, which is absolutely great. You have him next to a Sylvan of Wildwood. He gets plus two attacks. That's, that's five damage now. Where does it fall short, though? As soon as he takes three wounds and his damage characteristic, you know, comes down in the damage table, he is only going to be doing D6 damage with that, which is... A huge drop in its reliability for its amount of damage it can reduce because yeah sure you could just roll sixes and it's six damage and made no difference but the chances of that are quite rare it goes from basically being like six damage to like three four damage on the average so and we all know how reliable averages are of course but he has also got the massive impaling talons which is nice because this is one attack freeze to hit then it's two to wounds but that gets worse as it goes on uh, minus two rend one damage and with the nice thing about the impaling talons as well is if he gets a six to hit with it, 
inflicts d6 mortal wounds instead of normal damage. So again, not the most reliable thing, but if you get it, very nice there. He can also use the Sylvan of Wildwoods to teleport around the board, so potentially like a, a cheeky sort of um, objective grab or something like that later on. And like the rest of the Tree Lords, he also has a way to make the enemy fight last in the combat phase. So basically it's a big stomp he does. And what that means is on a 4 plus, that enemy unit you picked up was within 3 inches of him in the combat phase will be fine last. So that is very useful as well, particularly if he gets charged by something nasty, he has a way to avoid that damage. Because then if he can hit back before they can and he's on full health, ooh, can he do quite a lot of damage. So the enemy's going to want to try and take this guy out with range first. So that is the Spirit of Durfu. Again, like I said, I'm not going to break down all the War Scrolls and stuff for all these units, but mainly just the ones that I want to, I sort of highlight. It's like, I think he's really good in combat. I'm not just going to say that, I'm not explain it. I'm going to tell you why and we look for his rules. But going through the next one, it's going to be the Sylvaneth Tree Lord Ancient. So this guy is all right in combat as well. He's going to have three attacks to do D6 damage, which are called like the Sweeping Blows, which is the same as like the Sylvaneth Tree Lord has as well when we get to him in a moment. He's also got the Impaling Talon, like Spear of Durfu, to try and make the enemy suffer those D6 mortal wounds on that 6 to hit. He has also got one shooting attack, and I sort of hesitated there, because I was going to say a good shooting attack, but it is one shooting attack, so that's only one dice, but it's a 2 to hit, a 3 to wound, so they're going to be minus 1 rend, D6 damage, and it's got an 18 inch range, but again, only one attack, so be prepared to roll that 1 to hit with it. But, you know, joking aside, if you do get it off, it, it can be quite good, you know, it can be a way to snipe up those enemy heroes, especially those like little, I think, what are they, the Skink Priests as an example, that have the four wounds, you could potentially take one of those out if it, for some reason, got within 18 inches of you, <laughs> but you've got that. And then when we talk about more sort of abilities, because obviously this guy, you're taking him because he's the Tree Lord Ancient, you know, he's a wizard, he's going to have a few more abilities about. He's got a nice command ability that allows for your units, if they're wholly within 12 inches of him, they get to reroll, save rolls on one. Bear in mind, your kind of hunters extend this ability, so they will always be getting it if he triggers it as well, which is obviously good for everyone who's nearby those kernel of hunters, but I just wish it would have been more useful in the terms of those kernel of hunters. Basically, instead of piling all the way, we'll get to them in a moment, they can reroll all failed save rolls in the combat phase, and this guy's making reroll, save rolls on one, so it would just be nice if this gave them plus one to save, and then it really synergized with the other ability, but like I said, that's where a couple of things we can see that don't make the book so strong. So then we have something else you can do, which I mentioned earlier, which is to set up a Sylvaner Wildwood. So basically what you do is you just set up a Sylvaner Wildwood uh, once per battle in your hero phase, and it has to be wholly within 18 inches of him, and more than one inch away from any other models, terrain features, or objectives and add it to your army. And this is a lot more easier way of doing it, rather than a layer or trying to wipe out enemy unit and then grow some trees from their corpses but trees that are really considerate about social distancing and not getting into anyone's personal space. So no, it's nice the Tree Lord has an easier way to do it. Um, he has also got an all right spell, which you pick basically a Sylvan of Wildwood that is wholly within 30 inches of him and enemy units within three inches of that suffer D3 mortal wounds. So, you know, like a big explosive arcing bolt, if you will. So it's quite good. Um, and it shows that he's got some use there. So then going on to the normal Tree Lord. So we've already, like I said, talked about this guy earlier. Essentially, he is a cheaper version of kind of the Spirit of Derfu, but mainly, to be honest with you, the Sylvaner Tree Lord Ancient. A cheaper version of the Sylvaner Tree Lord Ancient is not a caster, doesn't have that better shooting attack, has a shooting attack, but it's it's not great, it's all right. Um, has Makes four attacks with the sweeping blows instead of three. But then there's no really much versatility in it. It doesn't bring on a Sylvan Wildwood. It's not the caster. It doesn't have a command ability. So I would rather just pay the more points and get a True Lord Ancient. But that is my, that's my ultimate opinion. If like you brought one on free with um, a Lair as an example, or you had enough points just for a, a Sylvan F True Lord rather than like the Ancient on Durfu, then yeah, you could see use. Like I said, one surprised and killed three of my Varengard, so I can't talk too badly about them. But I realised that my opponent was very lucky when he did that. So... Yeah, they're alright, but nothing really special, enough really to sort of sing home about it. And obviously you build the other two out of this kit, so I'd build one of the other two, probably the Spirit of Durfu, in my honest opinion. So then going on to the Foot Wizards, as I've called, in this army. So the first one we've got is going to be the Branch Witch, and we've already mentioned, I don't even like, actually add much to the army. She is like one of the most like combat effective small wizards in your army, if you like, but... That's not really why you're taking her at the end of the day. If you want to do better in combat, you're going to take, you know, you can use your Kernel of Hunters 
or his spear of Durfu, or anyone else. So, yeah, I don't really feel like she has much replacement, which is a shame, because she's a nice model. And then going on to what I think is better, though, is the Branch Wraith. And why do I think the Branch Wraith is better? I mean, it's because she is obviously a wizard, so she can cast a spell, but the spell she actually gets is Rouse to Wrath. So uh, this is a cast on various 7, so no guarantee it'll go off, unfortunately. But if you do get off, you can summon one unit or ten dryads and add it to your army. The summoned unit must be set up more than nine inches away from the enemy units and wholly within one inch of an awakened wildwood. That is within twelve inches of the caster. The summoned unit cannot move in the following movement phase, so it's not really too hard to do to be more than nine inches away from the enemy, especially if it's a wildwood that's fairly more back of the board. So you can do it that way. So it's a way to generate uh, the dryads because it's not like you can only do it once per game. You can do it multiple times. Obviously, if you summon dryads on turn five or something and it's not in particular use, then yeah, that's just a waste. But you play it well, um, you get more versatility out of her compared to the Branch Witch. And then the next two foot wizards are a little bit more different and more interesting because they are, as you can see on the picture, it looks like a warband. And that's exactly because they are warband. They are from Warhammer Underworlds, which is the box game. And then they brought those warbands through Age of Sigma War Scrolls into our game of Age of Sigma. And the warbands tend to not be that good, if I'm completely honest with you. For some reason, games workshop can't seem to make something rules for in one game and then make it have good rules in another game. It just it just doesn't seem to happen with their box games for some reason. And for this unit, it suffers the same problem. In my honest opinion, you're better off taking something else because this spell's not particularly good. It spells basically like a way to, on average, make an enemy unit suffer three mortal wounds. On average, it's nothing particularly special. Um, the war band doesn't really add much. If the Warband was saying along the lines of, instead of allocating a wound to this caster, you can allocate it to one of the members of the Warband, then suddenly you go, oh right, so this caster now has like an extra three wounds or something like that. I can see more use in it, but honestly, no. It just unfortunately suffers prey to not having much use in the actual game of Age or Sigma. You then have Skaef's Wild Hunt. I think that's how it's pronounced. Maybe wrong on that, but whatever. There's the one with the Beastman looking, not Beastman, Wood Elves. Warband from Warhammer Underworlds as well. And this one, I actually have, I would say it has more use because I believe it's cheaper in points. Also, it can run and shoot or still charge, which means that this movement can be quite fast. Yeah, I mean, like these guys are going to melt in combat, but you know, it's movement's all right. But that's not the reason why I'm saying it could have use. The reason I'm saying it could have use is because of its magic, which is Might of Kurnoff. So, Might of Kurnoff's custom value of seven. It successfully cast pick one friendly Sylvaneth unit within 12 inches of the caster, that is visible to them. Add one to wound rolls for attacks made with many weapons by that unit until the start of your next hero phase. And why do I like this? Because it adds synergy to your army where Sylvaneth don't really have the most synergy in all the armies of Age of Sigma. So by adding just this to give you that plus one to wound, there are ways for you to re-roll wound rolls. You know, if we look at Alario for example, I know it's a big point sink but you can reroll wound draw, so getting your plus one to it could really help you depending on what unit it is. So I could see these guys having use in the Sylvan F army. The problem is with these guys, I believe the only way to be able to buy them outright at the moment, unless you buy them secondhand, is from Beastgrave, which is one of the box sets for Warhammer Underworld. And again, is it worth buying that box set just for this unit? No, but in case you happen to have bought that box set and you're wondering how can they use these guys in the Sylvan F army, there could be use in there by terms of its spell. The problem is cast on very seven and you don't get pluses to cast as far as I'm aware. So not guaranteed, but if you do get it off, um, you can get it. And like I said, I mentioned when you go against things like, you know, Seraphon and stuff, but I'm not gonna lie, I played against Seraphon the other day and I was getting plus three to my cast in and I still wasn't getting it, right? <laughs> as uh, I was playing a Skaven with that, which is annoying. So if you get no pluses, you know, it just doesn't really make too much of a difference, but you're not always playing against those armies. But yeah, an actual warband from a Warhammer Underworlds, uh, that could be useful. There's a few of them out there, there's a few hidden gems, and I'd say the Wild Hunt could be one of them, which is cool because I do like those models as well. Sylvan Fs, I've already mentioned, is an army that I am really much in touch with those models. I grew up in the countryside and forests and all that sort of thing, so it really does touch those nostalgia parts. So then we move on to the Arch Revenant. Now the Arch Revenant is a hero you want to take to help out your Kern of Hunters. And the reason I say that is because it allows them to reroll hit rolls of one. Bear in mind there are other ways to get reroll wound rolls of one. I say other ways, mainly for a <laughs> real. But, um, so you can stack it there if you'd like to. 
You can also do things with this guy with his command ability that allows you to plus one to the melee attacks of a unit of Kerner Punters that are nearby. So now that means they're more effective in combat. We talked about how Kerner Punters are one of your best units in this whole army, which we'll get to next. And it really shows that this guy can help out. He's also pretty fast. He's moving 12 inches. He can fly. He's also the uh, hero you got in that big box set against the uh, Green Spike Gits as well. So it's the latest Sylvaneth hero for Age of Sigma as well, which is cool. He's a nice model. And he's helping out your Colonel of Hunters, which, like I said, are going to be one of your most important units in your whole army. And with no further ado, let us actually get on to those Colonel of Hunters. So if you're wondering, are they different box sets or anything like that? No, it's just the same box and there's three different ways to build them. And the three different ways to build them are essentially just there's three different weapons you can give them. The whole unit has to have the same weapon, so you can't have one with a bow, one with a scythe, and one with a sword. All the unit has to have the same weapon. And the three that we have here, so the first one you can see have got the swords, the second ones have got the scythes, and then the third ones have got the bows. So the bows ones are the most simple. They're the ones for your range unit, of course. They've got a large range. It's not bad at all. It's 30 inches. And remember, they can also move five as well. So that's a threat range of 35 inches with their shooting. It's, like I said, two attacks, force to hit, free to win, minus one round, D3 damage to that. Force to hit is a pain, but, you know, you can do things like... Um, Body fire to make it reroll one set hit with a command ability, spending a command point there. So there's ways you can play around it. However, what we talked about the Arch Revenant, it's got a way to give you plus one to your melee attack. So that kind of makes you want to go on the melee side. What I will say though is I do like the bows because so I think it's a nice bit of threat range. I wouldn't mind having one or two units with the bows in my list for sure. And then when we go on to the melee options, so we've got the sword and we've got the size. Right, so the swords have a 1-inch range, they're 4 attacks, they're freeze and freeze, minus 1, 2 damage. So those are going to be the most reliable ones, because when you compare it to the other melee option, which is the size, they are good in the terms of if you've got a big unit, because they've got a range 2, it's 3 attacks, freeze and freeze, minus 2 rend, and D3 damage. So a reason why I say the sword's more reliable is just because it's got that nice flat 2 damage and it's more attacks, However, if you want to go for more than a unit of three, so a unit of six basically at that point, and maybe even unit nine, go size because you really need the range because these bases are not, you know, 32 or 25 mils. So they're going to be quite big. So you want to have the two inch range on that one there. But if you go for a unit of three, go swords. The other nice thing you've got with no matter the loadout is what I said about the start of the charge phase. You can say that this unit will sprout fawned branches if you do so until the end of the turn. This unit cannot move except to pile in up to one inch, but you can reroll save rolls for attacks that target this unit. I mentioned that when I talked about the Tree Lord Ancients command ability to reroll those save rolls one. And the other nice thing about these guys, it's, it's only a little thing, but at the end of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll one dice for each model in this unit. For each four plus, that enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. Right, okay, so that means you got a unit of, let's just say, six of these guys, the enemy unit takes three mortal wounds. Well, I know it isn't loads, but it's just an added bonus that's worth not forgetting. So my overall thoughts about these guys is you're going for a nice, simple unit for combat purposes. The unit of three, go the swords 100%, they're more reliable. If you go more than unit of three, go the size, because there's more chance to be able to get more of them into fight. And that minus two rend is obviously going to help you out more against those elite armies. And then if you're going against... Let's say something where there's a lot of synergizing heroes that like to stay at the back of the board, definitely go bows. And if you can't obviously know what you're going to go against because you don't know who your opponent is or something like that, but it's a, like a random game sort of thing, I do hear that the scythes are the best way to go. That's why I've heard from people who actually play Sylvaneth a lot. They go, yeah, the other ones are good, but the scythes overall are best. Obviously, the shooting do a completely different job, but they're better than the swords because people like to take bigger units of Kern of Hunters sometimes, so that's the overall opinions there, but I think they each have a place which is nice. There's not one where it's just like you never use it. The bows can be good at range, and they're probably the ones that were most popular when Sylvaneth first got a release, and now are the ones that I least see when I go against Sylvaneth. But I think they definitely have some play, If I, especially with some of my army. So they brought those, and then there's no way really for me to be outside of 30 inches or 35 inches of their threat range without trying really hard, and they snipe away some of my key synergizing characters that will really make a huge dent to my capabilities in my army 
And then moving on to the battle line. So this is something that I always do mention when I talk about how to start collecting armies, no matter what army it is, because battle line is something that you have to have in your army if you're playing a legal match play army. If you're not really too sure how to make a legal match play list, go check out a video I recently did on it, talking about how to build a list. But anyway, for the battle line for the Sylvaneth, we have Sylvaneth Dryads, and then for Pacific Sylvaneth battle line, we have a Tree Revenants and Spike Revenants that come out of the same box, so it's easy to compare them. So firstly, the Sylvaneth Dryad, they're going to be your cheapest ones. I really think they're your most survivable ones as well, like we've already mentioned, they're by a Wildwood, you make the enemy miles want to hit you. You can also do things like plus one to your save, even near Wildwood as well, and that also benefits your output as well by the Dryads can pick an enemy unit within range of them, and they're plus one to hit that unit in the combat phase. So they can be very good, very survivable. Remember, you've also got a allegiance ability that allows you to pick a terrain feature on the board and if you're wholly within six inches of that terrain feature you don't take battle shock or if you've got someone nearby to inspire presence you can really make these seven of dryads stick around for quite a bit longer no they're not more tech guard where they get to reroll failed save rolls and everything like that but you can make them pretty survivable nonetheless then we have our tree revenants that have a much more of a tactical purpose their combat is not too bad, but the reason why you take these guys is because instead of moving, they can teleport around the board nine inches away from the enemy, anywhere around the board. They're great for objective grabbing. I've played against even cities, a Sigma list that I have a unit of these in, and they're just using them just to teleport around the board, which is um, really quite good. I know you've got like Shadow Stalkers now from the Doors of Cain, which, yeah, they do a really good job, and they do give the Tree Revenants a run for the money, and some people prefer those. More, but in a Sylvaneth Allegiance, you're going to be taking Tree Reverence. And I think units of 5 are good, maybe a unit of 10 if you want to, but I think units of 5 just to do objective grabbing and stuff. And then you have your Spike Remnants that you can make out of the Tree Remnant box instead. And I really like them as well, I think they look really cool and everything else, and look quite creepy and sinister. And my personal feelings about them, I don't feel like they have so much of a place. And that's just because... Instead of having the survivability of the Dryads or the tactical purpose of the Tree Revenants, they focus more on combat output. So you can buff them up with Dreitcher and there are other ways to do it. But I really feel like they just they just don't do enough where you're better off investing the points that you want to spend on combat effectiveness in your army, spending them on Curd of Hunters instead or Spirit of Durfu or something like that. So I just feel like the Spike Revenants missed that mark. That's my own personal preference. But again, like I said, I really like the model. So if you think differently, let me know in the comments down below. So it'd be great to hear it because I want to be wrong on that one. But overall for the battle line, I'd say Sylvan of Triads for your main bulk of your battle line. So they are the tough ones that are quite hard to shift. And then you've got small units of tree revenants to jump around, annoy the enemy and to grab objectives when they can. So then we move on to the last one I just want to talk about, which are the Endless Spells. Because if we've gone through everything in this army you can get, I might as well talk about the Endless Spells as well. And the other reason why I want to talk about the Endless Spells, because Games Workshop, when they do an update for an army, they tend to give it Endless Spells. I know not every army, but a lot of armies, they go, here's an Endless Spell, and here's some terrain features, and here's the Battle Tome. And they make it sound like the first things you want to buy are the Battle Tome, terrain feature, and Endless Spells. Which, in fact, is not always true, as some of the Endless Spells are really, really bad. So... The ones we have for the Sylvaneth though, we're going to go over them now. We're going to go over the Spike Swarm first. That's the one right at the back where you can see there's like some hives and flies coming out of it. And what we've got is it casts on a 7, so quite hard to cast, again what we talked about. But the thing it's going to do for you is essentially at the end of your hero phase, you get to pick an effect it's going to have. And that's going to be either Vital Venoms or it's going to be Shielding Swarm. So basically each of those things, you only get to pick one, but basically whichever one you pick, you roll a dice for each silver unit that's wholly within 8 inches of it, and if you go for Vital Venoms, it's going to be on a 2+, plus. you add 3 to the unit's normal moves and charge moves until the end of the turn, which is good. Or if you go with a Shielding Swarm, again, pick a silver unit that's wholly within 8, and you roll a dice on a 2-up, you get to re-roll C rolls and ones for attacks that target the unit until the end of that turn. So when I first read this, I was like, oh, obviously the movement one's better. But bear in mind that you can use this in your turn to make your movement better for those units. And then if you're in range and it's the enemy's turn, then you can use the reroll save rolls on one. So I do feel like this has use, uh, this spell, which is quite cool. It can be used, especially in your army, that's not particularly really fast. It can now mean that your Curl of Hunters are a lot faster, your, especially your like Tree Lords and Durfus and everything else that are quite slow. They're faster as well. Also things like, uh, like I said, Curl of Hunters, like, 
threat range of their bows of 35. If they get this off as well, they plus three to it, so it's 38 inch threat range. So this one goes off pretty easy on the two ups, and it's got a lot of versatility, so I like it. Then looking at the Vengeful Skull Root, which is obviously the one that's the tree with the like skulls and skeletons and stuff amongst it. Really like not very Disney like I mentioned at the start of the video kind of tree we have here. And what it's going to do, it's got a cast and value of a 6. When this model is set up you can immediately make a move of it. So you set up wholly within 6 inches of you, it moves 8 and it can fly. So that means that this thing can move basically when you set it up it can go 14 inches away from the caster essentially with the move. And what it does is if a unit fails a battle test within 3 inches of any models with this ability, add D3 to the number of models that flee. This ability has no effect on units with the Sylvan of Keyword, so lovely so it doesn't affect you. Uh, there's loads of ways to like avoid Battle Shock. I really feel like that's something Games Workshop needs to step on by making Battle Shock more of a thing these days because so many people can avoid it. But suddenly if you're if you haven't got any command points, like um I've I've been in that position where I'm just so used to inspiring presence and stuff, and as soon as I realise I run out of command points, like, uh oh, and then if I take what I like to do, elite armies, it's like, well, it hurts if I lose any models here to Battle Shock and then plus an extra D3. So it can do something, but like I say, Battle Shock is not as big as the things it was. But why I like this is going to be the strangle route. So after this model has moved, each unit that has any models it passed across suffer D3 mortal wounds or D6 wounds if that unit is also within 3 inches of an awakened wildwood. This ability has no effect on units with the Sylvan F keyword. So that means that your Sylvan F units are absolutely fine, which I like, because the problem I tend to have with endless spells, especially the predatory ones, is that the opponent can just throw them back in your face, unless obviously you're a fat frog, somehow that means you're immune to it pretty much. So the thing what I do like about this though is your Awakened Wildwood, you can make it sure so the enemy is in range of them quite a lot of the time, and now it goes up to D6. D3 is meh, not very good. D6 is that is nice and especially if the enemy's unaware of this not like i got you moment but you know you they asked what your end of spell was you told them and then they just forgot at some point and then you do this on them that is really gonna hurt them so i like that again situational but if you manage to get it off right you manage to play to it right can do a lot of mortal wounds so then the last one which is also the best looking one of course the glade worm that's the one you can see at the front of it is the big armored worm coming out the ground so that's got a castle value of six it actually has a couple of abilities, so when you first I mean, cast it, I'll say, like I did with the tree one, is that you have to set up wholly within 6 inches of the caster, and it moves 8 inches and it can fly. So again, basically when you cast this spell, you can make it effectively go 14 inches when you first move it. And then after this model has moved, roll a dice for each unit within 1 inch of it, on a 3+, plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. This ability has no effect on units with a similar keyword, again, you're immune, which is great. And then you've got the other ability, which is Healing Mist. So after this model has moved, roll a dice for each Sylvan F unit wholly within 6 inches of this model, and roll a dice on a 3 plus heal up to D3 wounds allocated to that unit. So what I'd say, unless that's a hero or something you're healing, you probably are just going to move this to whatever unit you want to heal. It's not like, oh, I'll be able to do like a mass area effect, because it's not a huge range, it's wholly within. Um, so... My sort of thoughts of looking at all three of these endless spells is obviously, like I said, Glade Worm is the best looking one in my honest opinion, but my favourite one's the tree one, just because I like the potential of doing D6 mortal wounds. It's a lot, right? It sounds quite cool. I know it's not guaranteed to go off, but if you get it off, fantastic. You're going to love it. I do like the Swarm one, where basically you get to make you reroll save roll the one, or you get to add that to your movement, but it's not the most reliable in the terms of it's a close range you've got to be to it, so... You're going to have to probably dispel it and reset it up again later. But if you use it as you're quite like a defensive and you're just using it to buff up your Kernel Hunters with the bows, I like to see the play there because on the two ups it is reliable in that sense of things. And the best things about these endless spells is they're not expensive at all. I believe the most expensive one for these endless spells is going to be like 50 points, which is the, um, uh, pretty sure that's the Hive one. So like we just said, where you get to buff your movement and stuff like that. But if you want to take the worm and stuff, the pretty good on tree for the tree as well, just for a punt and see how it goes, I think that these could be definitely worth trying out for sure. And as this video has gone on for quite a while now, something I do want to quickly do as I do at the end of these like start collecting videos is talk about basically the sub allegiances if they have any, which still enough do, and sort of talk about what each sub allegiance kind of builds towards. So again, I don't play the sub this is only from what I can read and see and from my experience of what I've actually played against. 
So to start, we've got the Oak and Brown, which to me looks like the one you want to go for if you're taking a lot of things like Tree Lords or Tree Lord Ancients or Spirits of Durfies. And the reason for that is because when for any of those units, you look at their damage table, you subtract two away from it. So like, it means the Spirit of Durfie will be staying at damage six on his sword for longer. Just generally your stats will stay better as it turns for monsters when you look at the damage table. Then the command trait gives you like plus one to wound for whoever's got it so you, you can make them survive longer your monsters and then the artifact gives you a six up uh, wound or mortal wound negate as well. And then your command bit is basically you pick one of your heroes and then units within six inches of that hero down to take the actual test so it can be useful for that. And then going on to the next watch is going to be the Naru. So it's ability so you can reroll hit rolls of ones for attacks made by friendly Naru units while they are wholly within 12 inches of any friendly Naru wizards. So it really shows that this is all about the magic one, and it does continue on. I'll go on to talk about the command ability you will get of this one. So you can use the command ability at the start of your combat phase. If you do so, pick one friendly Naru unit wholly within 12 inches of a friendly Naru hero until the end of that combat phase. Roll a dice each time you allocate a wound or mortal wound to that unit. On a 6+, plus, that wound or mortal wound is negated. It's alright, there's nothing to write home about. And then the command trait, which is nurtured by magic. So once in each of your hero phases, if this general successfully casts a spell that is not unbound, pick one friendly Naru unit wholly within 8 inches of this general. You can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to that unit. So that's a big range, very generous there. Um, what I would say, obviously you're going to give this to the guys with the Astro to power because it would be very useful for it. So what we'll go on now is going to be the Chalice of Nectar. So when making a Carson or a Binding roll for the bearer, Roll 3d6, remove one of the dice of your choice, and then use the remaining 2d6 to determine the cast on binary roll. So that's useful, it's going to help you get up your healing as well, um, and it's going to help for your magic, because we've already said that this army has a few spells that can be quite good, but you don't really get any inherent ways to plus your casting, so there's a way to do it there. And then going on to the next one, which is going to be Heartwood. So what you get for your abilities, add one to the Brave characteristics of friendly Heartwood units while they are wholly within 12 inches of any friendly Heartwood heroes. So right, I mean, it's not great compared to a lot of these abilities you get in sub legions these days. And then the command ability is Lord of the Hunt, so you can use this command ability at the start of the combat phase. If you do so, pick one enemy unit within 12 inches of a friendly Heartwood hero. Until the end of that phase, you can reroll hit and wound rolls at once for attacks made by friendly Heartwood units that target that enemy unit. So that's quite nice there, rerolling ones to hit and to wound. It can definitely help out your reliability, so yeah, I quite like that. And then we go on to the command trait. So this is Legacy of Valor. So if the general is slain, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this general before you remove from play. Roll a dice on a two to five, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, on a six suffers D6. Obviously D3 is nice, D6 obviously fantastic, but just look like what it doesn't say here is on a roll of a one, it doesn't do anything, which is annoying because <laughs> it's like, it's not the best command trait of obviously you get that one and do anything. It's, I think it should just be even on a one that enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. That's just like a fail safe. And then the artifact of power is Horn of Consort. So you can reroll hit rolls for attacks made by friendly Heartwood Kernel Hunters while they are wholly within 12 inches of the bearer. So the thing I like about that is it doesn't have to say. They must be melee weapons, so you can use it to help out your shooting as well. But what I would really like is if you were using it for melee, the Lord of the Hunt uh, command ability that allows you to reroll hit rolls of one and wound rolls of one. Why can't this give you plus one to wound and plus one to hit? And then the artifact gives you the rerolls, because then you're just doubling up on something that's kind of the same. For if you're going Kern off Hunter heavy, it's what I would say there. I mean, it's not bad, but it just feels like some of the abilities are doubling up there. Um, if I'm completely honest with you, I would say this is probably the one if you want to go more heavy on the Kern of Hunters from what I can see though. Um, yeah, okay, then going on to the next one is going to be Iron Bark. So what you get in here for your abilities is you can reroll battleship tests for friendly Iron Bark units while they're wholly within 12 inches of any friendly Iron Bark heroes. And this is where, like I said, the Silver Nerf Battle Tome is a perfect and it kind of annoys me now because like, I've read through a few of these and they all seem to like minorly buff your Battle Shock immunity. Which, if you're that bothered about it, you're just going to spend a command point. So, like, I can see where the frustration comes to Sylvaneth players. And then looking at the command ability, which is Stand Firm. So you can use this command ability in the combat phase before the players pick any units to fight. If you do so, pick one enemy unit that made a charge move this turn and is within one inch of a friendly Iron Bark unit and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, that enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So... 
That that can be useful. Like if the enemy charges you a sign, obviously like a monster has only got three wounds left. For some reason they charged you because they thought, yeah, they're gonna charge, wipe you out, and there'll be no attiliation at all. But the problem is I find with this is on a two up. So imagine if you spend a command point to do this, and it's on a two up and you don't even get it. Like, yeah, I don't like that command ability. Um at all really. Yeah, it's pretty shit. So then going on to the command trait, so the mere rainfall. So you can reroll save rolls with attacks made with missile weapons that target this general. Uh, I like that you can reroll save rolls for saves that you do against like missile weapons and stuff. I think that's useful. There's a very heavy uh, missile shooting meta at the moment. So yeah, I do like that. And then the artifact of powers add on to wound rolls for attacks made with missile weapons by the bears. Obviously on a thing like a spirit of death or something like that could be pretty useful um, to really help you make sure you nail those attacks through. And then we go on to Winterleaf, which is actually my favourite one. And it's the one that I can kind of read when I'm doing this video and not want to basically kind of hurt myself. Because this is one that I can actually get behind. Because and I've done a wide play Winterleaf video as well. And that is the ability mainly is the reason I like this. It's Winter's Bite. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a melee weapon by a friendly Winter Leaf unit is a 6, that attack inflicts 2 hits on the target instead of one, make a wound and save roll for each hit. I really like that. Flat out across the board, all your seven of units are doing it, it's exploding sixes, they're really, really good. This is how that one guy, like I mentioned before, with his tree lord, managed to wipe out my unit of three vanguard that are on full health. Because he rolled three sixes with the sweeping blows, and yeah, it's really hard to get that. I know, what are the odds? But the odds were, he got it, and he wiped out one of my units, and he left me in a place where I was like, what do I do now? So then you have your command ability, which is Branch Blizzard. So you can use this command ability in your shooting phase. If you do so, pick one enemy unit within 12 inches of a friendly Winterleaf hero and is visible to them. Roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit. For each six, that unit suffers one mortal wound. So not the best horde clearing one, but pretty good. It's command ability, so the enemy can't stop it. It's not a spell or something, the enemy can just switch off as an example there, by unbinding it. This is just something you can do, you just spend a resource to do it, which is a CP. As for someone like myself, I recently played a lot of Skaven, so I'm taking blocks of 40 clan rats, something like that. If you're going against Gloom's White Gits, as an other example, you can roll 60 dice, they've got 60 in a unit or something, you can really start doing some pain. So I like that, and it's not like um, that's your one ability you get. Like, that's what you have to spend the CP for. Like, your standard ability you get by going to sub legions is better than that, but I do like that. I don't think that's a bad command ability. It's better than the last few we've had a look at in the, all of the sub legions, to be completely honest with you. Um, oh, to be honest, like, the the Heartwood reroll ones to hit into wound was good as well, but I think the Horde Clearer there is nice. Um, then you've got the command trait, which is my heart is ice, so roll a dice each time a wound inflicted by a melee weapon is allocated to this general and not negated on a 5 plus the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound so because there's each time a wound is inflicted it could could be a few um yeah it's not it's not great but it's all right and then the artifact of power is frozen kennel so once per battle at the start of the combat phase you can pick one for any winter leaf unit wholly within 18 inches of the bearer after that unit has fought in that phase for the first time if it is within three inches of an enemy unit it can make a piling move and attack with all of its many weapons it is armed with for a second time. So yeah, that's a really good artifact to power right there. It's not a CP you're spending to do that. You're just getting it for free, which I really like. And it really just shows why the Winterleaf is the one that stands out amongst the rest. I mean, we have a couple more to look at, but I'll tell you straight away, Winterleaf is my favourite there. Exploding Sixes and the artifact to power, I think, are the two best things. And then when we're going on to the next one, which is Dreadwood, essentially this is going to be useful if you want to go with Spike Revenants. But like I said, I really don't think Spike Revenants are that great. I'm happy to be proved wrong, but I don't think they're that great. And what I would say the other thing you get in this is, though, which is good, is the Command Ability, which is Sinister Ambush. And essentially allows you to do a um, teleport in your army. And it's your standard sort of teleport. So you pick a unit that's within range of a Dreadwood hero, Move it off the table, set it up again nine inches away from the enemy. Which is um which is alright, could be good, could get you an objective, that sort of thing, but it doesn't beat Winter Leaf in my honest opinion. And then we've got Harvest Boon, so you can reroll hit rolls of one for attacks made with friendly Harvest Boon units that made a charge move in the same turn. That's their generic ability. And then you've got things like their command ability, which is you can use this command to start a combat phase. If you do say so, pick one for any harvest 
boon unit wholly within 12 inches of a friendly harvest boon hero until the end of that phase add one to the attack characteristics of that unit's melee weapons you cannot pick the same unit to benefit from this command ability more than once per combat phase so this is good especially if you stack this onto your kern of hunters for example with the arch revenants one now that's plus two to their attacks which is good i like that and then the command trait you get is each time this general attacks with a melee weapon it can make a 6 inch move after all its attacks have been made and resolved. If it does so, it must finish the move 3 inches away from the enemy unit. So that means that it can move out of combat. And the great thing about that is you can move in your opponent's turn. Which means your opponent may charge you and then they don't kill you. You do your attacks and then you move out. And you've actually moved onto an objective or something like that. I do it quite a bit in my Skaven army where I can retreat out of combat. In, like, in the combat phase, and it's won me games by taking objectives. So yeah, I do like that, and I've used a similar ability like that, like I say, in my Skaven, that's won me games. And then you've got the Artifact Power, which is going to be the Silent Sickle, so pick one of the bearer's many weapons, add one to the attacks, cash of that weapon, nah, not bad, it's alright. Um, so with that, I'd say the Harvest Boon is probably the second best, yeah, I like Winter Leaf's my favourite, Harvest Boon, and then we're probably going to be looking at Heartwood, then the Gnar route just for its bonuses, the casting, but it's not fantastic, the casting. And that is basically all the sub allegiances. And I know, look, when I was reading through some of this stuff, I was looking at it in a bit of a negative light because some of the some of the rules just don't help themselves. And it shows that why I said at the start of this video, it's not going to be my standard how to start collecting video, purely because most people say that Sylvan F are terrible, not even worth looking at. I think by reading through this, I've proven that they're not terrible. They're just having a bit of a hard time at the moment. And if you want to take them on and win games with them, you're going to have a hard time. You'll probably lose a lot of your first games. So the reason why I've made this video quite different is because I'm really trying to dedicate to to let you guys know, particularly if you're new, don't do this army if you're a bit faint at heart when it comes to, you want to win some games and obviously to uh, boost your morale up. If you want to have a bloody challenge, do this army. This is not for, like I said, the faint-hearted. You're going to want to do this army if you want to basically work twice as hard as most of your other opponents. But if you beat them, the reward for yourself is twice as great. And I'm not just saying that. Generally, it is. Like, for example, I know there's a tournament I'm going up to see, which is like a team tournament. It's on TTS, but I'm taking Skaven. I'm the only Skaven player there. Most armies are things like Seraphon, Zeech, Doors of Cain, INFD, and all those sort of things that I know can easily beat me. But if I can beat them then that reward of gratification to myself is absolutely huge, right? So basically, if you want to have a challenge, play Sylvaneth. I hope I've helped you along your way of knowing how to start because the book has got some stuff in it that aren't as great. I'm trying to help you try and stay clear of that and trying to say what we have got here, this is what you want to take in your army to really make the most of it. It's going to be a hard enough army to win your games with at alone. You don't want to start chucking things that aren't going to help it really. And that's what I've been trying to do in this video but like I said if you go against other armies out there which to be fair is probably about like 60% of other armies out there aren't smashing and winning all their games they're not in the top five everything else those armies that you can have probably a, a decent chance of winning your games if you've gotten to know this army well so I really think I've I've laid that on enough now saying that it's not the strongest army you've got to play well it's you've got to accept this army as a challenge don't think you're going to win your games easy everything like that and yeah i really don't feel like i need to say that enough but like i said i hope you enjoy this video sorry if i sound a little bit off i was um also like i said i've got a sore throat and stuff at the moment but i wanted to get this video out to you guys turned out to be a very long one because it's been a very different sort of start collecting video we actually went through all the units not in loads of detail but just mentioned every single one and i hope that you can learn something out of it Again, if you're a Sylvaneth player and I've said something you disagree with, let me know down below. Explain why so we can all learn from it because that's why we're all here. Like I said, I'm not an absolute expert on the Sylvaneth. Basically, this video is me trying to help out Sylvaneth players or people who want to play Sylvaneth because no one else is really trying to help them. So that's what I've decided to do this video. And obviously, you guys chose it on a poll as well, which is the main reason I'm doing it, to be absolutely honest with you. But I hope I've helped you guys in some way if you did enjoy the video please smash that like button the subscribe button and the bell notification you haven't already those are free absolute free ways to help out the channel and it really really does go miles in helping promote the channel on youtube essentially and lets other people know that this is a good video to watch at the end of the day and also if you've got any other questions please put them in the comments down below and i'll try my honest best to try and help you guys out as best i can 
What I'd also like to say is a massive shout out to my patrons and YouTube members again. Because of these people, it really gives me the justification to be able to do this channel. As if I didn't have any kind of support towards helping run an of this channel, I wouldn't be able to do it. So that's going to be my patrons, my YouTube members, like I said. So that's going to be my Morgoths who give me so much support. I really do not know what to say apart from please keep it up and you're all beautiful people. And that's going to be Jonathan H, Philco, Bleed Red and Christopher G. Thank you so much for your continued support. Really is keeping the channel going. My vampires as well, which are Mia, Martin S, Raspberry21, David A, Ronnie H, Doug P, and Spare Bear. Thanks, guys, for that tier as well. You're giving a lot of support, and I really am appreciative of it. And then, of course, my Necromancers, which are Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, Michael W, Quad, Cranky Wombat, Crystal F, Crystal C, James S, and Steve T. All you guys really collectively help keep the channel going as well. So, huge shout out to you guys. If anyone would like to become a YouTube member, you can click the join button next to the subscribe button. If you want to, just check it out. Even if you just give a dollar a month or something or a pound a month, it really goes straight towards keeping the channel going. And if anyone would like to support me on Patreon, you'll find a link to it at the top of the description down below. Like I said, anything you could give, even a dollar a month, goes straight towards the channel. And I would be really, really appreciative of it. But if you can't, guys, like I said, just smash the like button, subscribe button, bell notification. And that would mean the world to me as well. So with all of that aside, guys, and this long Silver Neff video out, I hope that I've been um, helpful, but also honest and fair as well. I didn't want to mislead anyone or anything going through this video. I'm not going to say everything's fine because that would be um, lying to you guys, basically. And I'll, I'm trying, but I'm also trying not to just say everything is crap and trying to see what we can do to make it work. So uh, I really hope you've got something out of this video. And like I said, if you've got any more questions, put them in the comments down below. I'm happy to help. So with that aside, guys, Remember until next time to stay safe, wear a mask, wash your hands, and for God's sake, stay hygienic. So if you do want to do Silver Neff, you can actually start playing them at some point soon in the future. And of course, more importantly than any of that, until next time, remember that Nagash is all, and all is one in Nagash.